Thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in many ways, uh, well, in every single way that I can imagine, I'm delighted uh, to be able to welcome you, especially because I think that after millennia of suffering and praying, the Messiah has come. <laughs> right? And Rabbi Lerner has brought him, her. We are going to find out in a few days. Or maybe the Mossad is uh, guilty of this too. All right. Yeah. So uh, it's a very special privilege uh, to extend a warm welcome to uh, all the new friends, old friends. There are many familiar faces uh, in the room, many new faces. We hope that this is going to be the beginning of your friendship with our institute. And it's uh, especially important to extend this warm welcome on uh, this very cold and chilly Montreal <coughs> evening. Just came back from Israel two weeks ago, and it still feels a very, very difficult adjustment. My name is Chaba Nikolini. I'm a professor at the Political Science Department, and I'm also directing the Azrieli Institute of Israel Studies, which together with Professor Norma Joseph from the uh, Department of Religion, uh, we organize, set up, uh, and uh, with the help of several other colleagues, such as Dr. Bina Freiwald, such as Dr. Laura Lerner, and of course, with the able daily assistance of Ms. Jennifer Solomon, we've been able to run for the past six years now. Um, our esteemed and distinguished guest tonight uh, is Rabbi Lee Lerner. And looking around the room, I see that there are many personal connections, personal friends uh, who came came out especially uh, to, hear, to hear the Rabbi here, Rabbi Lerner, because of who he is, because you know him so well. As a, as a former congregant, as someone who he brought closer to Judaism, um, or in, in whatever shapes or forms, uh, the rabbi can touch uh, his congregants, uh, uh, his flocks, uh, personal lives. I, I know that he did. So to many of you, he doesn't need an introduction. But it is part of our tradition to always offer a brief formal introduction about the guest whom we are going to turn the floor over to. So uh, I would like to ask for your indulgence just for a couple of minutes to tell you the obvious, that is a brief list, a brief uh, uh, summary of the many wonderful things that characterize Rabbi Lee Lerner's life service uh, and leadership. So Rabbi Lee Lerner, he's a rabbi, a teacher, a writer. He has served two major congregations uh, in North America as senior rabbi. He spent 14 years at Mount Zion Temple in St. Paul. He chaired the Jewish Federation campaign. He renewed a black Jewish dialogue. He created an outreach and long-range planning program. In 1989, he became spiritual leader of Temple Emmanuel, here at Temple Emmanuel Bet Shalom here in Montreal, where he served with distinction for 23 years. As president of Christian Jewish Dialogue, he created an international conference that also brought together and involved three Montreal-based universities. The temple itself, under his leadership, became recognized as an NGO, as a non-governmental organization by the United States uh, State Department for its work against human trafficking. He also organized an extensive outreach program for LGBT persons and their families in the broader community. Rabbi Lerner created a trilingual Hebrew, French, English prayer book for the temple and also brought art and in general interactivity into the congregation's life. Since retiring as Rabbi Emeritus, although I I never thought that there was such a thing as a rabbi retiring. I think you're in it for life. But nonetheless, since formally retiring, how is that? Since formally retiring as Rabbi Emeritus uh, in 20, uh, 2012, Rabbi Lerner and his dear wife, our very dear friend, uh, Professor Lauren Lerner, they have spent many winter months in Italy where the rabbi volunteers as a reformed synagogue congreg congregational rabbi in Florence, Rome, and Milan. Tonight, we are delighted to bring to you Rabbi Lerner and his most recent artistic literary creation, a novel, The Mossad Mashiach. The rest, Rabbi Lerner, is for you to that. Thank you very much, Professor. I'm very pleased to be with you this evening. And um, I have discovered over many years that, um, can you all hear me first of all? OK, yeah. Uh, that uh, when someone comes to talk about their book, they often read the book. And um, it's probably more fun to, let, to read it yourself, you know? And so what I'd like to do tonight, instead of reading from the book, is to share with you why I wrote the book, and then tell you a little bit, just 
introduced you to the plot of the book to uh, perhaps titillate you, your curiosity. Um, so let me talk for a little while about Israel's ultra-Orthodox and us. Are you able to see the screen or am I blocking it? All right, we're okay. And uh, to begin with, I want to say that uh, I'm a reform rabbi and I'll be talking about the ultra-Orthodox. I don't want you to think that I am against someone being ultra-Orthodox. I'm against bad social policy uh, in Israel. And that's what a lot of this talk is about, that certain social policies will just simply need to be fixed. And uh, so let's get that up front, and I may yet say it again, OK? So Israeli ultra-Orthodoxy. I'm talking Israeli. How did ultra-Orthodoxy arise? Who are the leaders? What groups compose the ultra-Orthodox? How do they benefit Jewish life? What problems does ultra-Orthodoxy present to Israel and to us? And can we have a positive relationship with the ultra-Orthodox? And is there an active uh, agenda, an action agenda that we might follow? So those are some of the questions we want to deal with. Before I begin to talk, though, I want to ask you a question. In fact, I want to ask you two questions. And I'll tell you what they are, let you think about them for about 10 seconds, and ask them one at a time, OK? So the first question I'm going to ask you is, what does Israel mean to you? Particularly if you're Jewish, but if you're not Jewish, that's OK, too. What does Israel mean to you? And the second question is, what would improve your inner feelings and your relationship with Israel in the coming year? Okay? And when I ask you this question, these questions, I don't want you to think about the Israel-Palestine controversy. I'd rather, this is about domestic life, okay? This whole talk is about domestic life. So limit your comments, please, to Israel as a, as a nation within its own borders and not thinking about its relationship to other groups or nations, okay? So what does Israel mean to you? Home. Home. Mm -hmm. Easily enough said. You're feeling home there. Uh, and since uh, Shabbos' wife is there, no wonder. Uh, <laughs> okay, what does this really mean to you? I was born there, so the first thing that comes to mind is life in Hebrew. Life in Hebrew. Yeah. Hebrew is a living, everyday language, also. You know, real language, not just uh, Tanakh. And the culture. Yeah, all that goes with it. A haven for Jews. A haven for Jews. Someplace every Jew can count on going to if, God forbid, no one else, no other nation would open a door. Yeshev Shamat and the possibility of salvation uh, or redemption. Okay, possibility for redemption. The, the right, it's the a righteous idea. remnant. Of, it's a religious idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the remnant that remains from exile. As the child of Canadian born child of Holocaust survivors, it gives me a cultural and ethnic identity. Cultural and ethnic identity is part of who we are. Yes these days. You couldn't say this in 47. Okay, anybody else? The Holy Lands. The Holy Land. Okay. A miracle. A miracle. That's a great miracle there. Whoever expected it to happen. Anybody else want to say it? Yes. I'm not Jewish, I'm Ukrainian. And uh, Catholic. Went to Catholic school. So Israel, for me, is uh, the history, so much of history connected to Christian religion, connected the Jewish people. Ukraine was one of the biggest concentrations of Jewish communities, say, in the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. So of course, this is part of my upbringing, of my consciousness, and so on. What Israel or the Jewish people have contributed to the world, how they were involved, and so on. It's sort of, you can't sort of 
fake being a Western person today without being conscious. Okay. The Israel. I think it's the answer to a dream that Jews have had for millennia. And it gives them a feeling of security that finally they have a home. Giving a feeling of security that finally we have a home, the answer to a dream. Let's, very good. So let's turn now to one more. Okay. A vacation spot. I'm sorry? A vacation spot. A vacation spot. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right. We'll be there in a couple of weeks, three or four weeks. So, well, all right. So now the second question. What would improve your feelings and your relationship with Israel in the coming year? What will improve your feelings about and your relationship with Israel in the coming year? All right, I'm willing to start. I'm not that I'm ill at ease as we speak, um, but Israel has this great challenge of reconciling its domestic or social policies um, and moving forward into to a more modern nation state. I think that there's great debate about this and it would make me feel good to see continued discussion. Okay, continued discussion of uh, social policy issues that Israel faces, <coughs> and yeah. which, which would bring it more in line with what we think of as a modern Particularly with respect to intra-faith relations. Intra-faith. Yes. Okay. Within yes. the Jewish people. Okay. Um, it would be nice to see a real statesman running the show. Ah, okay. That <laughs> also. Uh, this is a, a, a Netanyahu Taina, right? A complaint on this. So, okay. <laughs> what else? Anyone else? You want to say yes. I would like to see closing of the gaps. There's so many um, large gaps, education gaps, Ashkenazi, Sephardi <coughs> gaps. Uh, uh, wealthy, poor gaps. Uh, closing that, of the gaps. Yes. Lots to think about. Less, at least lessening. Yeah. Lessening. Working toward closing. Okay. Yes. Um, what did I read? Tw well, like 20, fam 20 families control 42% of the stock of Israel. Something like that. 60%, 45 When you get that high, it doesn't matter, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Other thoughts? I mean, obviously, one of the biggest, Hokam uh, al-Kolim, most recently, one of the biggest issues is uh, how to reconcile the secular and ultra-orthodox. Uh, okay. So this is a piece of it, the secular versus ultra-orthodox. And for, from our point of view, also, liberal Jews, conservative, reformed Jews, also look at it as not saying we're, because we're not really secular, but we are not ultra-orthodox or orthodox in our approach. And we also have certain feelings about it. So, I guess I could just say sure. something to uh, you know, the, the, the yes. observation. Um, when I was in Israel just a few weeks ago, uh, there was a piece in Yediot Ahono, the uh, newspaper, uh, by the former president of the uh, Israel Supreme Court, uh, Benish. And she said, the greatest challenge facing us today, and I think in the diaspora Jews feel that also very acutely, is reconciling these two foundational principles of Israel um, as a Jewish state, as a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways in which these two imperatives of Israel from its inception um, are, are difficult to reconcile. Like this, um, some yeah. of them. And I think a lot of diasporic Jewish voices speak to that, but also from within the country. Very good. Okay, so one more. Well, I think it's similar to two of the points that were there, but a halakha can't be something at its opposite. So absolutely the philomim and the datim, whatever, however you want to refer to them, because I don't actually think those terms are accurate, uh, need to discuss what is halakha, why women are not allowed to lead prayer services and sexuals. And uh, is Israel ready for a woman chief rabbi? And I'm not interested to be a rabbi, so it's not me. <laughs> but well, you're asking what, the kind of the questions, uh, yeah. I mean, okay, so these are tough questions. Um, um, may, may I just say something about that? Is that Mar the, the Prime Minister of Israel, Rosh Namshala, Mark Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu, said women have equal rights in Israel. But is that accurate? Maybe that's a different talk. Not in the religious, yeah, not on the <laughs> religious sector. Okay, let's let's go ahead. So I want to talk to, a bit about the word itself, Zionism. Okay, was the temple built on Mount Zion? <laughs> no, it wasn't. Okay, here's a view from Mount Zion. And 
the temple and would have been, you know, over there, right? Okay. So from Mount Zion, you can see both the area where the Temple Mount is, and you can see housing going down the hill, probably by the city of David and so on in ancient days. <coughs> so you get two things from, look, from looking from Mount Zion. You get a view of the spirit, spiritual peace, and you also get a view of the everyday work life of the, of the people. Kind of the way it is. A Zionist is concerned about Machanel Yehuda open their market and buying and selling and living a regular life in Israel and also worried about the spirit. And um, I can think of no better place to have a wedding in Jerusalem than at the top of Hebrew Union College. That's the view you would have on your wedding day. Not so bad. Okay, um, so being a Zionist has to combine the spiritual past and present and future and the material present and future of the Jewish people in Israel and for us. In 1967, here in Montreal, there was Expo 67. And at Expo 67, Israel had a pavilion. And the curious thing about that pavilion, which we learned at the Israeli Institute, uh, was that this pavilion wanted to present Israel without any relationship to the diaspora. Israel on its own two feet after 20 years of Israel. That was the idea of this entire um, pavilion at Expo. And there are plenty of Israelis who want to feel. We're Israeli, we're a nation, we do our thing, we do it our way. And the diaspora, well, that's maybe from the past and maybe has some relationship to us, but we're doing our own thing. But we had some three events happen only months ago in the summertime that tell us that there is a strong relationship between the diaspora and Israel itself. Number one I think about is the women of the wall who were strip searched this summer trying to have a service uh, going to the hotel. I think of the list. Let's see, what else have we got? I got a list here. Okay, we wanted to have a place by Robinson's Arch where we could daven as liberal men and women together, a woman's voice could be heard, that sort of thing. Netanyahu promised it would be there, and then he backed off of it in the summertime to our um, great upset. The Israeli chief rabbis last summer issued a list of 116 rabbis who were essentially blacklisted. In the strange, so some were in Canada, many in the United States, um, at least one in Montreal. Of course, there were no women on the list at all because the chief rabbis don't think women can be rabbis. That's another story. But we were upset by that because of that blacklist from the chief rabbi. And then there was the, uh, there was the incident with the uh, women of the wall as well at the Kotel. So uh, Israel and Netanyahu said he was going to rethink withdrawing that place. And the women of the wall continued to attempt to make their progress. And um, the chief rabbis had to back down saying, oh no, it's not a blacklist. Well, I don't know what it was if it wasn't, but they, they were backing away from it because they care about the diaspora. They care what we think. So there is a relationship that Israel now must recognize. Now it happens that Israel has powerful chief rabbis. How did it happen that Israel got such powerful chief rabbis? It was the status quo agreement of 1947. Now here are the two chief rabbis of Israel today. Ashkenazi Chief Rabbi David Lau and Rishon Metzion, that is the Sephardi Chief Rabbi Yitzhak Yosef. In 1947, David Ben-Gurion made a deal called the Status Quo Agreement. And he agreed that Shabbat would be Israel's day of rest, that the kitchens and what was served uh, at official meals of the government would be kosher. He agreed that family law, that is marriage, divorce, and set, et cetera, would be in the hands of the rabbis. 
continuing the tradition from the Ottoman times and from the British times. So there is no civil marriage in history. And that regarding education, each group would have full autonomy to do its own thing, except that they would have to have education that the state thought was important. You know, things like science and mathematics and English, perhaps, and things like that, civic. And they were supposed to do that. So in 1947, the status quo agreement went into effect, and it is still in effect to this day. And that's how the chief rabbis were created, by an agreement with Agudas Yisrael, Agudat Yisrael, that particular group. And there are political parties that are religious parties in the Knesset. Agudat Yisrael is primarily Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox. This is the founder of Agudat Yisrael, Avraham Mordechai Alter, 1866 to 1948. I want you to notice some of these dates, okay? We're talking about the ultra-Orthodox. He died in 1948, okay? He's the founder of this political party, which is now a part of United Torah Judaism. Today, Agudat Yisrael is headed up by Yaakov Litzman. He was, until weeks ago, the Minister of Health, well considered by the people of Israel as a man concerned about the poor and was doing a good job as a health minister. But he got into a brouhaha with another of other, a group of other of Orthodox representatives and the state saying, you shouldn't be fixing trains on Shabbat. Of course, Shabbat's the only day the trains run. Don't run. Right? But he said, you shouldn't be fixing the trains on Shabbat. Does this sound familiar to you? OK. And so what did he do? He resigned his position as health minister. But then Netanyahu turned to him and said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. You won't be the health minister because you, you, you can't serve in the, in the government in that way. You said so. But we'll make you the vice minister of health and give you the whole portfolio of the minister of health. So you won't have lost any responsibility. You just have a different title. And you'll continue to do this good job. Whether he can do that or not, I don't know, because the Supreme Court once ruled you can't make a vice minister the man in charge or the woman in charge. But we'll see. In discussing LGBT health needs in 2016, however, Litzman did compare uh, LGBT people to sinners who danced around the golden calf. So he does have some uh, issues that he presents to contemporary people. They could get a Pikuach Nefesh ruling on that and work on rotating teams once a month because Pikuach Nefesh is used after the Kabash. Or I use the word truck. <laughs> yeah. they do. But it has to do with the train and not Yeah, well, somebody has to make the argument. Okay. Part of um, of the uh, Agudat, no, of the United for Judaism Party, is another piece of the Haredi group, and that's Litvish Haredi. These are Lithuanian Haredi. You can identify them most readily by the fact that they're wearing black suits and white shirts, usually no tie, and uh, they don't have, you know, like the big first primals and stuff like that, and the special white stockings, no. They look pretty, like, business-like. Um, in fact, in, not until relatively recently, you could even see them in a brown suit or a beige suit, but now it's all black suits, okay? Um, this is a map of Lithuania, and this is a map of the blue is a map of Lithuania and Hebrew. I'll bet that some of you had a Hebrew teacher who talked about the Taira. Anybody have a Hebrew teacher who talked about the Taira? No? That's Lithuanian style. Yeah, you know. Okay, so. It's Torah, not Torah, and Sin, and not Shin. So it would be, you know, um, to say song would not be Shir or be Seer in the Great Hebrew. But that's not the point. The point is that the Litvish Haredi are in Israel. And they um, organized a party called Degel HaTorah, Flag of the Torah. And the Flag of the Torah party, founded by Elazar Shach, who died in 2000. And one, he was opposed to settlements down the Green Line, and he said any study by women should be for supporting her family. Study for knowledge only is a waste of time. Uh, he didn't want army service for the yeshiva students. These are some of the 
things he stood for with Degel HaTorah. Degel HaTorah joined with Agudat Israel and formed United Torah Judaism Party, which is the Knesset today. Another leader of Degel HaTorah was Yosef Shalom Elishi, who died in 2012. And he was a very strict ultra-Orthodox rabbi. One of how strict he was, he forbade the use of Shabbat elevators. Can you imagine being in the Plaza Hotel on the 20th floor on Shabbat and being Orthodox? You could raise a lot of money by climbing those stairs, you know, telling people, I'm going to go up the stairs and down the stairs 10 times this Shabbat. Sunday, make a contribution in honor of my strength. Uh, my sister does that in Seattle for uh, leukemia. <laughs> she climbed 67 stories in 17 minutes. I can't believe it. Well, anyway, that goes It seems to me up. being leaders are good for the health. They're both good for the 102. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very good for the heart. You might, now, he is anti Zionist. He's anti Zionist. So you might ask yourself, how can you be anti Zionist? and make a political party in the Knesset? And the answer is, what we just heard a few minutes ago, we want to move Israel to the point that it lives by halakha. That's why they're there. They want an Israel that is under halakha. So those are the two parties that formed the um, United Torah Judaism. Party. The leader of Dekel HaTorah is Aaron Yehuda Leib Steinman today, and he's author of a book called Leading with Love, Guidance for Our Generation, and is known as a modest and warm leader. I'd like to say, okay, that's it, but it's not, because the first rule of Israeli political life is that 10 Jews have 11 opinions, and translated out fully, this means even you someday could form a political party. That, my friends, is an Israeli ballot that you're looking at. So you pluck whatever you want to vote, and you drop it in the box, and you vote for a list of candidates. You don't vote for someone writing in your writing. Uh, so that's how it works. All right? So the there's more. Anybody? There are Sephardic Haredi in Knesset. Avad de Yosef, Mishon Metzion, Sephardic Chief Rabbi, uh, founded Shas, and Shas is another word for Talmud too, by the way. It is um, Shomrei Sfarad, the guardians of Sfarad, and they're concerned about the Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews of Israel. And today's leaders are Ari Derry and David Azulai, um, members of Shas. Um, I have to say, that uh, Arya Derry may be known to you for other reasons, <coughs> because um, Derry, uh, who is the interior minister and has responsibility for things like who's a Jew, with that, with that, was formerly the minister of interior and stole money. He served 22 months in prison in the year 2000. And he returned to public life in 2011. In 2014, Ovadia Yosef, the founder of the party, said that he is a thief and a wicked man. But in 2015, he was at the head of the Shah's list. And so he is in Knesset. Uh, David Azulai is Minister of Religious Affairs. And he's been in the Knesset since 1996. Um, he referred to the women of the wall as provocateurs, and um, he called Reform Judaism a disaster for the nation of Israel. But Shas has a definite um, political stance. One is money for their school system, which is separate from um, other school systems in the country. It is Israel should be run by halakha, and Shas favors special attention to the Sephardim and the Mizrahi, the Jews from Iraq, the Jews from Syria, etc. So there's just one more party I want you to know about, and that is the Jewish Home Party, which is headed up by Naftali Bennett. For whom will the Haredi in the West Bank, in the settlements, vote? Maybe for Jewish Home. Bennett is the son of a San Francisco family that made Aliyah. 
mostly now they're representing modern Orthodox Jews. But the nationalist Orthodox in the West Bank are acting more and more like ultra-Orthodox. And 30% of the settlers are ultra-Orthodox. And the reason for it is that the housing in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem is too expensive. And people can't afford it. So they move to the territories and live in less expensive places. Those settlers may choose to vote Jewish home because Jewish home wants to annex area C of the West Bank. Area C is 60% of the West Bank. Okay. okay. That's a lot of territory. And um, so it's possible that we'll see ultra-Orthodox people in that party. We don't know. So who represents? non-Orthodox people outside of Israel and in Israel, uh, of course, you can vote for whatever political party you want. But for those of us outside, we have to use NGOs to get our point across. And here are a few NGOs. Artsenu, Artsa, Artsa Canada are all Zionist voices of, of Reform Judaism. Merkaz, whether in America, Canada, Argentina, <coughs> is the conservative voice of Zionism in Israel. Iraq, Israel Religious Action Center, is a part of the Israel Movement for Progressive Judaism, for Reform Judaism, headed up by Anand Hoffman, who was also recently the um, leader of Women of the Wall. And Anand has a team of lawyers, and they go to the Supreme Court to defend the rights of non-Orthodox Jews in Israel time and time again. And often, they win. Um, so Iraq is important. And also, so is Nikki Maor, a lawyer in Tel Aviv, who leads LACO, Legal Aid Center for Olim, for people who've made Aliyah. Not always easy to get the Israeli government to recognize your Jewishness so you can make Aliyah. You sometimes need to see a lawyer. There are 28 lawyers working for LACO, working for Nikki, and they have helped 30,000 people make Aliyah. I've sat in the Supreme Court when Nikki was there to defend the rights of a, of a particular individual and her conversion, which was not an Orthodox conversion. Um, should I pause and tell you a story? Um, quickly, uh, Nikki told me that um, a person was trying to make Aliyah. And the Interior Ministry had a person with a file who said, I'm going to reject this. So Nikki said, you remember me? She said, oh yeah, I remember you. She said, well, the last time you saw me was at the Supreme Court. She said, yes. And the last time you saw me at the Supreme Court, you lost. She said, yes. So she said, let me tell you, I'm going to go to the Supreme Court with this one, too. So let me ask you, would you prefer to spend your time messing around the Supreme Court and waiting to get heard for a day or two? Or would you rather just stamp the approval on this file and be done with it? She said, I'll stamp it. <laughs> <laughs> so Lego is very important for people from reform, conservative backgrounds. And by the way, it's, although sponsored by reform, we also take care of conservative conversions too because they are not recognized by the uh, Orthodox rabbinic either. OK, NGO, the World Zionist Congress. This is US, not Canada. The US percentage. Artsa had 56 representatives. Merkaz had 25, which gave the two groups of conservative reform a majority of representatives at the, uh, in America, of the American group at the World Zionist Congress. What does the World Zionist Congress do? Of course, it elects, elects its officers. It also recommends the Jaffe, the Jewish Agency for Israel, which is the largest Jewish charity in the world and takes in the money from all of the federations in North America and elsewhere to distribute it to the mercenary causes, right? what they ought to be doing. So being involved in World Zionist Congress 
is very important, and that's part of the NGO business that we have to care about. The next World Zionist Congress is in 2020. So if you're interested in having some influence on where Federation money goes and who it serves in Israel, join a group that is a member of the World Zionist Congress and get your voice heard, okay? So now, Haredi men have an unemployment rate of just above 45% at the present time. My sister-in-law said, don't worry, the rate is going down. I told her it was 55%. She went on her computer and said, no, the government says it's 45%. I said, what's so good about that? It's 45. Would you be happy if Canada had a 45% unemployment rate? I don't think you would. That's called depression. Or, or worse. Or worse. Now, <clears throat> Netanyahu made sure that this past year, a little more money went to the yeshiva students to help them live so they wouldn't have to go to work. And guess what? The unemployment rate went up again. So now it's, I don't know what, 46%, something like that. At any rate, Unemployment in Israel is not low. It's really pretty high. It was 14% otherwise. But then that figure includes the 45% who are unemployed, okay? So amongst the Haredi. And the reason it's that way is because um, the education that's offered in most of these shikot is Talmud and Jewish text. And there is very little that has to do anything with math, science, uh, civics, English, the courses you need to make yourself employable or to go to university. And as a result, okay, look to your left, look to your right. Only one out of 12 of you will get into university. Now, what percentage of Israelis do you think have a university degree? 49%. Have a university degree. And only 8% even get into university from the Haredi. In fact, the numbers that pass the high school exam are somewhere between 8 and 17%, depending on the year. So Israel pays yeshiva students to go to yeshiva. How did this happen? Abraham Yeshaya Karelitz, the Chazon Ish, who died in 53, was a Haredi leader in Israel. And at 48, he went to Ben Gurion and he quoted him, Sanhedrin 32b from the Talmud, justice, justice shall you pursue. So he said, the first justice means strict justice. Right, said it, said it. The second justice, said it, said it, said it. The second justice means compromise. What kind of compromise? Well, there were two camels going up the, the hill, a narrow hill in Beit Chachoron. One of them was filled with goods, and the other one had nothing on its back. And the Talmud teaches us that we're supposed to, if we have the camel that doesn't have anything, let the one laden with goods go first, and then the other one will go. And Mr. Ben-Gurion, the Chazanish said, we in the yeshivas are laden with the goods of Jewish spirit. And we are marching up the same path as everybody else. And you must let us go first. Don't make us go in the army. Forget the draft. And we'll all be happy. So Ben-Gurion said, how many are we talking about? Some say 100. Some say 400. So I'm going to go to the lodge side and say that there were 400. All right? 48 over 400. There were 800 exempted in 68. There were 40,000 exempted in 2005. And there were 108,000 exempted from the draft in 2015. That's what happened. And what can I tell you? That's a lot of people. The draft numbers last year were down 3% because so many people were exempted from the draft. Last year, I figured, based on enrollment, that there were 16,000 Haredi, men and women, who would be eligible for the draft. That's just a guess, okay? Last year, 
the target was 3,200 to draft men, and they drafted 2,800. And we know of at least one person who is not Haredi, the reformed Jew that stuck him in the, in the Haredi battalion. And then I have to ask, why are there Haredi battalions? And why aren't the women being drafted? I'd like to know. Because it's Tzahal that makes Israeli. It's the Israeli army that brings people from all different walks of life together and makes them re recognize their unity as a group. So those who get out of it are um, escaping the possibility of a certain amount of integration. So the program is Torah to Oman to. This Torah is his Metier agreement in 1948, and that still continues until about two months ago in the Supreme Court ruled everybody must be drafted. But we're waiting to see what will happen, because not everybody's happy about it. If Haredi, 83%, don't want a draft. Everybody else would like to see the draft. Okay? And they demonstrate against it, and they are represented in Netanyahu's government, and if they come up with a new law that walks around this in some way, maybe they'll get out of it. Who knows? It depends. We have to go back to the Supreme Court. The amount of money that is spent supporting Haredim in the yeshivas is immense. And uh, the Bank of Israel chair, Stanley Fisher, in 2013 said, if Israel's economy is to continue to survive, survive or thrive, Israeli Arabs and the Haredi Jewish population must get to work and become contributing members of society. Otherwise, Israel could come, become an inequitable welfare state, squandering valuable resources on the transfer of, uh, of money. So that was his parting shot at the Bank of Israel chair, and the finance department backed him up again. <coughs> All right, so you remember Animal Farm? George Orwell's book, Animal Farm, where all the animals were equal, except some animals were more equal than others? Okay, so in my view, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel are more equal than Reformed Jews, more equal than secular Jews, more equal than even modern Orthodox Jews, who all serve happily or not in the army, and it's time to say to the Haredi, mustn't be piggish, which is another way of saying, don't be a chazer. Okay. <laughs> the rapid growth of the Haredi population, I think, um, causes a certain confusion, because democracy and demography are not the same thing. Just because you have a majority of people of a certain type or ilk does not mean that they get their way, because people have rights, and rights are guaranteed and uh, belong to everybody. So there are probably about 300,000 people in Israel who can't be married by the rabbinate, or the rabbinate won't marry them, Russians and LGBT and others. So what do they do? They go to Cyprus. Hey, it's not a bad deal. If you know someone who wants to get married for $569, they'll even throw in the hook. <coughs> I don't even know if you can rent one in Montreal for that. So, <laughs> all right. If you want to know about Israeli chutzpah, Israelis have great chutzpah. And maybe the greatest of all is that Israel signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, put Knesset, puts it on its website, and the country exempted itself from the laws from the Universal Declaration regarding marriage and divorce, and left it in the hands of the religious. Because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that people have a right to marry. It doesn't say what kind, it doesn't say male, female. It just says people, etc. Okay, and um, also Article 18 regarding freedom of religion and belief. It does not give an equal measure to non-Orthodox Jews. Equality before the law is protect, protected in Article 7, which means in Israel that all should be drafted equally. 
but yeshiva students, most of them don't have to go or haven't had to go. And they get subsidies that university students don't get. And now university students have lined up and are suing in Supreme Court to get the same subsidies as the yeshiva. If they do, that's the end of the whole thing. Because the country can't afford it. Article 26 says that education should be for strengthening respect for freedom and rights, promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship. And that's not a Haredi yeshiva education. So these are not minor problems. This is a lot of bad policy that Israel has allowed. By the way, we learned right here in the Israeli Institute that Ben-Gurion later regretted his having given the, the uh, freedom from the draft to the ultra to the ultra-Orthodox. So, how did ultra-Orthodoxy arise? The primary cause is reaction to modernity. Moses Mandelson, translated the Bible into German with Hebrew letters, opened the way to becoming part of the society in Germany, proto-Germany. Napoleon called the Assembly of Notables, asked a series of questions the Jews answered to his satisfaction, and they became citizens of France. Citizenship means being an equal member of a nation state, it means belongingness. And Sheher Zalman of Liadi, the founder of the Bavis Hasidism, wrote to, regarding Napoleon, should Napoleon be victorious, wealth among the Jews will be abundant with the hearts of Israel will be separated and lifted from their Father in heaven. But if our master, Alexander the Tsar, will triumph, though poverty will be abundant, the heart of Israel will be bound and joined with their Father in heaven, and for God's sake, burn this letter. <laughs> yes, Shehra Zalman of the Adi, back in Napoleon. No, back the Tsar, against Napoleon. Hard to believe that Napoleon would have brought human rights with him. Okay. Um, how the ultra Orthodox arose? Reaction to modernity. Reform Judaism. Israel Jacobson had this uh, special school, boys and girls together, so good that multi faith, it became multi faith. The Hamburg Temple, Abraham Geiger trying to defend women's rights in Judaism. All of this caused. Moses Schreiber, Fatam Sofer, to say, Chadash Asur Min HaTorah, anything new is forbidden by the Torah. You can't bring in anything new. And how did he come to this opinion? He took this piece of Mishnah, Masechet Chala, chapter 1, saying five species are subject to the law of Chala and are also subject to the prohibition of new produce, new produce, crops, and he made it into anything. So who's the big reformer here? I think it was amazing for him to make such a statement. But many people have lived by this. Chadash, Asur, Min HaTorah. How the ultra-Orthodox arose. Samson Raphael Hirsch and modern Orthodox Judaism said, be a Jew at home and a man on the street. Look at him, this Orthodox Jew. Tucks his pants behind his ears, you can't see them. Right? wearing a modern suit, trimming his beard to look like a, a modern 19th century German Jew. He was a man on the street, a rabbi in Frankfurt, strictly orthodox. But that was opposed. And Zionism, the central issues were Jewish nationalism that said, since citizenship didn't eliminate anti-Semitism, the five states, for example, Let's make a Jewish state. And the controversy was, can a Jewish state be established without the coming of a Messiah? And so Josef Chaim Sonnenfeld died in 1932, founded Haida Haredis. Haredi, right? Haredi Judaism. Ultra-Orthodox community organization. They are anti-Zionist. They tell their members not to vote in Israeli elections, not to take money from the government. And the head of the Haida Haredis doesn't live in Israel, but lives in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, Satmar Revi, Joel Teitelbaum, was president after he moved to America. So here are the underlying causes of ultra-Orthodoxy, the possibility of citizenship and integration into society, democratic ideals, 
democracy, not theocracy. Acknowledge progress. Women's rights, beautify the service, change to believable prayer, socialism and secularism, nationalism, which became political Zionism, and the adoption of Western ways of life. These are the causes of ultra-Orthodoxy. So what I'm saying to you is this. There would be no ultra-Orthodoxy without all, all that preceded it. And therefore, ultra-Orthodoxy is newer than reformed Judaism newer than Zionism, newer than socialism. Ultra-orthodoxy is the new boy on the street, not the old guy. Just because he's wearing old clothes doesn't make him old, right? So what do the Haredians think? It's very really juicy. Democracy is compatible with the Jewish state, in regard to what you said. The Haredi, 89% want the government of 89%. This was a survey in 2014. Shutting down public transport in the entire country on Shabbat. 63% of Israelis oppose it, 96% of Haredi are in favor. Enforcing gender segregation of public transportation used by Haredi, 62% favor it. Dati, 63% are opposed, even amongst the modern Orthodox, okay? Um, allowing conservative and reform rabbis to conduct marriages in Israel, the whole Israeli public is against it. Boy, we have liberal Jews. Too bad. And conscripting Haredi men to serve in the military, 83% of Haredi against, 72% of Israelis are for it. So, I think we know where Israelis stand. What the Haredim think? They agree that all Jews should have the right to citizenship in Israel. They agree that most Jews say Israel is necessary for the long-term survival of the Jewish people. But the Haredi have the lowest percentage of that. Why? Take a guess. Because the Lord will provide. The Lord, one, the Lord will provide. Two, they don't live in Israel. Oh. 35% in their heads are saying to you, they live in Eretz Yisrael. They live in the land of Israel. Like the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, the word Medinat Yisrael, state of Israel, does not come out of their lips. They live in Eretz Yisrael, and until the Mashiach comes, it is not the official Israel. Okay? That's why 35% of Haredi will say that. Happy 65% don't. We'll say, yeah, there is an Israel to come. Now, I don't want you to think that the Haredi are all cut from the same piece of black cloth. So here is a, just a list of, some, of most of the groups included in Haredi Judaism in Israel. That's a lot of people. And so how does, you were about to conclude, how does ultra-orthodoxy uh, benefit Jewish life, Israeli life? Well, first of all, replacement of population. Look, we lost six million during the Shoah. And as you can see from this chart, there are 750,000 approximately today with a 5% growth rate. There'll be six million Haredi alone in 2062. So they will replace that lost population. They'll also be possibly the majority in Israel. So that's another issue to look at. Um, the greatest number we have right now, the greatest number of students of Talmud ever walking the face of the earth at one time, and possibly the greatest number of experts as well in Talmud and Jewish traditional texts, thanks to the Haredi. They are deeply rooted in tradition and slow to change. No novels, no Facebook, no TV, no social networks thinking on your smartphone. None of that is allowed. All right? And as a result, they can look at us and say, you know what I see you guys doing? And they can make comments on our buying into certain modern ways that maybe not so helpful. 
after all, who knows? Criticism of modernity. And they are living examples of 18th and 19th century types of Judaism, not all kinds of types. What about disadvantages? How does Haredi Judaism disadvantage Israel? Well, there's a population explosion in central Israel. These are apartments in North Tel Aviv. That's a nice part of town to live in. Okay? Central Israel, you won't believe this. Central Israel, with Tel Aviv, has 2,028 persons per square kilometer. Greater Montreal, that's like central Israel, right? Is 890 persons per square kilometer. And Tel Aviv alone, just Tel Aviv, is I think 22,000 persons per square kilometer. But that's Tel Aviv. Right. Israel's constitution, the basic laws of Israel, they're called basic laws, were never finished because of objections by the ultra-Orthodox to equal rights. And the essence of the argument is, and this is what one of you was trying to say, maybe you were trying to say, the essence of the argument is this. Should Israel be a Jewish state or a state of the Jews? Right? What's the difference between Israel being a Jewish state and a state of the Jews? If it's a Jewish state, what does that mean? Majority Jewish. For all Jews. Majority Jewish. You think majority Jewish. Haredi think halakha, because halakha is what's Jewish. Right? A state of the Jews is a place where Jews live, they're not a state. Okay? That's, that is the difference. Israel exempted itself from the UN Declaration of Human Rights regarding marriage, so there's no civil marriage for LGBT, mamzerim, anti-religious, non-religious people in the hundreds of thousands. I mentioned the army draft down. Haredi and Dati oppose the rights of conservative reform uh, and other streams of Judaism have given us a hard time. It's a huge drain on government money. I think it was about 10 years ago, a billion dollars a year to support the yeshiva, yeshiva students. And despite the status quo agreement, people are being trained to be unemployed. I want to add that Haredi women are the door opener here because Haredi women are working, and Haredi women have a very low unemployment rate, just a little bit higher than the national average, and are beginning to enter all kinds of interesting fields. So it could be that the Haredi women will be the um, TNT that blows apart the whole situation. We shall see. Can there be a working relationship between liberal Jews, secular Jews, and the Haredim and the Hasidim? Well, my educated guess is no, because we are their raison d'etre. And if you're somebody's raison d'etre, you can't talk to them, because that would mean you recognize what you have or. Right? So how can they sit and talk to us? We're glad to sit and talk to them, but they're not glad to sit and talk to us. There are aspects of Haredi Judaism that are similar to what we would call cults here in North America. It's very difficult to leave the Haredi. 10% try every year, but it just doesn't happen very well. And Messianism is another factor in the whole thing. They believe Messiah is coming, and what they do, they do to bring about the Messiah we believe that we're trying to build an aid, which is as if the Messiah had come already, and it's up to us to do what we need to do to make this world a better place, to put a love, etc. The Orthodox, elder Orthodox, see this as a denial of Maimonides principles of faith, and we are her heretics. So, what can we do about this? Well, some of us write novels. Other, <laughs> I'll come back to that in just ten seconds. But for reformed Jews, support Arts of Canada, because Arts of Canada fights for the rights of liberal Jews in Israel. For conservative Jews, support Merkaz Canada, because they fight for the rights of conservative Jews 
But we now have 100 congregations together between the two of us, and 11% of Israelis identify with us, so we are making some progress. Um, also, you can support IRAC through the World Union for Progressive Judaism or for, through Arts of Canada to make sure that we go to court for our rights and keep on winning them. Because every step we take forward, usually we get pushed back a couple. We have to go time and time again. Another thing we can do, ask Federation where the money is going in Israel. Ask Federation if money is going to yeshivas that do not teach skills, manual labor, tech skills, whatever. Ask if they're going to schools that don't teach English, math, science, and civics. That's important. We must send our money to places where it develops good Israeli citizens. Um, strongly support also the New Israel Fund in Canada, which supports progressive causes in Israel. And I think you'll agree with their, their program. And Women of the Wall and Chidush, which is in Israel an NGO trying to get civil marriage in place. We aren't alone in this fight because the typical Israeli wants the Haredi to work, serve in the army, and be contributing members of Israeli society, both spiritually and materially. And I think it might possibly happen if we act over here um, and Israelis speak up over there and vote in the people who will make it happen. But I waited too long to see it happen, 40 years of serving as a rabbi, and it didn't. So I sat down and wrote this novel called The Mossad Messiah. And I have to tell you, it was a labor of love. It was a cri de coeur. Uh, it was, um, I recognized that the government was not dealing with bad social policy. But I also recognized that the Haredi were waiting for the Messiah. So I thought to myself, what if we send them a Messiah? What if Mossad and Shindad got together and did what they really aren't supposed to do, and that's mess with Israeli politics, and found somebody who was to be the Messiah, and who was maybe secular or reformed, and would be a mole amongst the ultra-Orthodox? So here's a bit of a plot, and then if you want to ask questions, you can. If you want to buy a book, I have a bunch. Okay, here's the plot. Once upon a time, there was a Hasid who went to Warsaw to study and talk to his second cousin or whatever, 10 times removed, for a little support, a great Hasidic Rebbe. He fell in love, this Hasid, with the Rebbe's daughter. And neither one of them were very interested in being Hasidic. They liked to dance. They liked to go to clubs. So he said, I want to be an engineer. And she said, go to Berlin and study and then be an engineer, and I'll join you. So he went to Berlin for a year, but he failed the entrance exam. And she sent him back, so to speak, and he went back and studied again. And he was getting a little tired of being alone, and he found himself a nice Jewish woman who was a big Zionist. And they had an affair because he was already engaged to this woman in Warsaw. I guess that's an affair. And she got pregnant. But then when she found out that she found out from him that he was engaged and he wouldn't even go to Israel when she was on her way there, she was so angry she told him, don't ever contact me, don't ever contact my offspring or their offspring. Stay out. And so he did. But he kept on sending a little money all the time to support the family. And when, at last, they escaped from the war, and Rachel was unable to have children, and he became the Rebbe, and he was 90-some years old, and Rachel died, then he had to reveal that there was a great-grandson in Israel who could possibly inherit his court and become the next Rebbe, because he was interested in Torah. And you must go now, he said to his majordomo, and talk to this person and see what you can do. 
Meantime, Shin Bet and, Mo and Mossad go to the same person because they know the money's coming to Israel. They follow the, the money trail from New York. And they talk to him and tell him, we'll give you a lot of money if you'll just, and we won't reveal the plot, if you'll just do this for us, whatever it may be. That is remaining to be revealed. Will he become the Mossad Messiah? Could he become even more than the Mossad Messiah? Who knows? You have to buy the book. Okay. <laughs> Are there any questions you'd like to ask? Is this okay, Chavez? Yes, of course, absolutely. We've been going on for a while. Yes, sir. All your preamble with the facts and figures and the whole history of Paradigm and so on and so forth, did, did that research lead you to decide to do a novel, or did you decide to do a novel and said, I must do some basic research to get the novel? Oh, no. Novels are uh, 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 the novel are correct. 50, 60, 70% of what you saw on the screen. I've been tracing for years. You've been what? I've been tracing for years, watching it happen. So I just all I did really was get the the, the, the real statistics, the, the nitty gritty statistics. But I knew what was going on. You know, terribly interested in Israel and uh, in the rights of of the, the human rights in Israel. For example, uh, during my sabbatical five, no, six years ago. Uh, I was integrating buses in Jerusalem for Iraq. We went to the uh, Haredi areas with, with um, secular and reformed women, put them in the front of the bus against the rules of the rabbis, and uh, showed them that the buses could be integrated because uh, the rabbis said they shouldn't sit in the front, the women should sit in the back. But it's against the law to force people to sit in the back of the bus. And it's strictly posted right on the bus that it's against the law. And I saw Haredi men going up to the seat of a woman sitting there and shaking the seat to try to get her out of it and go to the back of the bus. So, you know, I've lived this. And so what I'm doing here is just putting down on paper what I've known for ages. And the book um, is not a statistical analysis. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's sociological, it's religious, it's based on Jewish texts. In fact, Jewish texts drive the book, drive the plot. It's a very Jewish book. What uh, era is it? Is it World War II era? It starts in 28. 1928. 1928, and it ends up about 2028. Future. Okay. Past, present, and future. Most of the book is in the future. And Dave? Yeah. Do you see, I mean, what would your prediction be at the point where the Orthodox have a huge population? Is there some kind of, a, are they on a collision course with the secular? What, what happens at that point? What happens when they reach You don't need a majority to control the Knesset. You need a coalition to, to rule anyway. So if, and, and, and um, the ultra-Orthodox tend to vote the way their rabbis tell them. So you get block voting. So it's quite possible that they could accumulate in 10 years or so enough seats to actually form a majority uh, government, but probably not. Their main interest is in interior ministry, health ministry, all the domestic stuff that they can control. Right now, the supermarket law is a big issue. You know about the supermarket law? All right, the Knesset voted to, to close supermarkets on Shabbat. And guess who's going to enforce the law? Because it's Shabbat, it's clear. It's been a bunch of Jews around to enforce the law. How can you do it? So they're going to have non-Jews enforce the law. <laughs> That's what the plan is. But you see, bit by bit, this is an attempt to get halakha, to run the country. And I'm not against good law. I'm in favor, however, of just as in 1947, in the agreement, that the David Ben Gurion made status quo. He says the government will have a kosher kitchen. You can do what you want, right? So the government says you have to close on Shabbat. Well, that's certainly that gives you no freedom of choice in this particular matter. It's up to you. It seems to me as a person to decide how you observe. What What is the position of the ultra orthodox on the military? 
to be Well, they're supported. in favor of being protected, <laughs> and, they're, and they're against going in the army. How do they reconcile um, accepting modernity and the protection of their fellow Israelis without contributing? <laughs> they are contributing. Remember, the Chazonish. They're the laden camel. They're the ones who have the spiritual goods. Everybody else is a material good. Right? And they're bringing them up the mountain. Uh -huh. So their, their spiritual peace is something that Israel needs and wants, and I, and I agree, with. spiritual peace is something we need and want. But you are also asking a good question because we've got to talk about equal rights. This is, this is no, there's no equity here. But isn't this, you know, when we talk about equal rights, we look at this in terms of Western democracy, which is a rather well, that's what unusual Israel is. occurrence. Read well, the Declaration of Independence. <coughs> Israel is a Western democracy. Except they're not, not everybody agrees today. And I mean, the, the whole region is in turmoil over this, over this similar idea. It's conflict in the modernity. Well, yes and no, true. But right now, the majority of Israel, the Susan Peace Survey, think that Israel is a democracy. I hope it stays that way. Okay. okay. Yes. I have a question. Do, does the Reform Jewish Movement ob oblige or obligate Reform candidates to serve in the Israel Army? And I'm not just talking about Reform Jews in Israel, but I mean, wouldn't it help if reform, reform candidates? Reform candidates to be a rabbi. Do you serve? Oh yeah, for sure. Do you serve in the Israeli as uh, obligation? May I go a step further? I mean, did you since in the rabbi? eyes of the government. They really aren't considered rabbis at all. All of our rabbis who are Israeli serve in Sahal. That's not the question. That's not the, the question is Period. not just Israeli reform. That's what I said. Not no. just Israeli what, reform. All, all reform no. rabbis. I, 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 I'm, um, at the particular moment I was draftable, I was a US citizen, and I had an hour particular rule at that time was that we would go into chaplaincy. Right. Well, the, the, that's very similar. And uh, the second thing I, I find that would be very similar, I think it would be helpful if all rabbis around the world serve at least a year in the Israeli army. They a have perfect. No, it's not that simple because you can lose your citizenship in many places. Not like if you that. lose your citizenship. So. But there are agreements with it. And you also did not discuss the Hester Yeshivot. They're not the Alpha or the Gospel. No, Hester Yeshivot are Yeshivot where people serve in the army. So that's your distinction between Alpha Orthodox and Orthodox is those who serve versus those who don't serve. No, ultra orthodox is that group of, uh, that I listed. Do, do you enjoy talking to Orthodox Jews? Uh, uh, when you have, do you have go and have discussions about how that? And it's orthodox Jews, Jews I have no problem ground. discussing. Ultra orthodox Jews, Jews, for the most part, won't talk to me. Yes, interesting. <laughs> well, you should tell them that Abla Ose Shalom is a little bit. You should tell them that. It's all okay. All right. Okay. Um, last month, I took a flight to. Uh, uh, where I used to live in Winnipeg, and uh, I shared a seat with a Mennonite woman who looked a little askance at my made-up face. Uh, she was dressed in her traditional dress, and I thought, what an anomaly. She is looking at me with some disdain because I'm a picture of modernity, but she is using the airplane, which she is against. She's against the airplane? Well, they're against all technology. They're oh. trying to impose uh, 19th century agricultural lifestyle, but they do not deny themselves uh, automobiles. But you know what? So, like, there's this disconnect. That's because uh, those people, the Jads and the cars, they all have horsepower. Oh. <laughs> 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 yes, what I was wondering, while uh, listening to your excellent uh, talk, was these extreme conservative religious communities, what is going to happen in, in, in wake of the wave of populism and extreme conservatism sweeping many democratic societies, are they going to have more impact? And therefore, would the Orthodox in Israel also have greater impact on policies of Israel? It depends on the government. At the time, in 2013, there was an Israeli government that had no ultra-Orthodox in it and passed a law to draft ultra-Orthodox. But that government shortly failed, was unable to get a majority on some issue or other, 
fell and there was a new election, Netanyahu came back and aligned with the ultra-Orthodox, Degelat Torah, with the uh, United Torah Judaism and Shas, and was able to take that law out. So everything depends on who's running the country. So I'm just wondering uh, who, what is the origin or the background of the people who are most orthodox? Are these the people who came from various countries that were, say, not democratic countries, that didn't have a democratic tradition? Were these the people who came from the Soviet Union? Were these from North Africa? I mean, what is the, is there any connection between the origin of the, where they came from, and their presence in Israel today? And okay, their politics well, in Israel? Uh, Litvish Haredi come from the area of Lithuania. <laughs> Uh, Hasidic Haredim come from uh, Eastern European countries, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Belarus. Well, that's the idea. What about Poland. The, uh, people themselves? Well, by now, we're, we're in another generation or two, right? But you have to understand that after the war, the Litvish Haredim and the Hasidim had the most horrendous losses in the Shoah. Just, they were down to threadbare now. And they've come way back. And partly by their policies of strictness and um, almost, I would say almost, but being cults, cult-like, have kept people in, they've managed to grow back quite a bit. So that um, the numbers are, are high. So they are inbred ideas. In other words, they come, they are born or passed on with mother's milk to the children, yes. rather than going from one group to another. Exactly. And so if you don't change your group. You stick, if you're a gear, you're a gear. And that's it. If I can, can I get right? one more question. Oh. One last question. Okay. 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 And if, yes. One more question. Okay. Uh, I, know, <clears throat> I know the focus of your talk was Israel, but could you say a word or two about the effect that the split between the ultra-Orthodox and the modern Judaism is having on world Jewry? <laughs> well, um, you know, a lot, a lot depends on uh, demography. Um, you feel it a lot more in Belgium, where already are a large number of Jews. Um, you feel it a lot in Brooklyn, you feel it a lot in Rockland County, New York, but you don't feel it in, um, I mean, we have in Boisbriand, in Tasha, right? But it's just, these are small groups here. But they're growing very quickly and could well become a, a strong part of No, the but it also, it's also having an effect of <coughs> world jewelry on how they look at Israel. Uh -huh. um, well, Haredi, you know, as one guy wrote, wrote on the Lubavitch website, we have a very interesting and unusual relationship with Israel. We won't sing Hatikva, we won't put the Israeli flag in the shul, but we're very concerned that the Israeli army do well and that the Israeli people are healthy. And uh, things in Haaretz ought to be good. Well, this is Haaretz. That's Lubavitch. They play both ends. They play both ends. That's Lubavitch. But don't, the Lubavitch is part of ultra orthodox. I just want to press a little bit. And we have to hear a moment for the press. It's <laughs> <laughs> so. very short. I take it this is a self published book. And I was wondering, if, did you make any attempt to get a commercial publisher? or what? And did any of them just find it just too hot to the I have. They don't. Um, or you didn't even bother? Oh, no, I did bother. You did? I, I did. But it's uh, too kind. I think it's too controversial. And I sent out the first edition to them, which was probably, I, I, I dumped 12,000 words out of it in the second. One, one, one commercial publisher or one? No, no. So Not the publisher. To an agent. To so an agent. But then okay. I would have kept on going to agents if I were 62. Yeah. But I'm not. <laughs> OK? No, no, and I, I decided to, you know, I'm not buying any green banana because <laughs> I want to get this book out. So should've, I did. Should have changed the title to Fire and Fury. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Please join us now.
for joining us tonight. Before I would let you uh, enjoy some of the refreshments, and of course, if you want to engage the rabbi privately while he's still around, uh, please do so. Let me just remind you that uh, we have two very exciting events coming up in the near future. On February 28th, we have our faculty graduate student research seminar. There will be publicity coming out, and we certainly look forward to having you with us then. And on March 22nd, in collaboration with the Jewish Public Library, we will um, welcome and host Professor Kumar Aswami from New Delhi, who will be uh, sharing his, uh, the contents and the arguments in his new book about Mahatma Gandhi and the creation of the Jewish National Home. Very difficult subject uh, for anyone who is interested in the story of Israel, the life of Mahatma Gandhi, and um, Professor Kumar Aswami is certainly not shying away from the difficult controversy. If you are a Concordia student, or if you know a Concordia student, please remember that every week we have a draw for two tickets um, to the Israeli Film Festival organized by the Jewish Public Library. In order to qualify for the draw, you have to answer a question that is posted on our website. And every week we close the competition at, on Thursday at noon, noonish. So if you are a student, or if you know a student, please, uh, uh, please enter the contest. And if you are a Concordia student, or a Montreal student, or if you know uh, such person uh, in your family, in your community, please let them know, direct them to our website. Let them know that we have a citywide student essay competition dedicated to the 70th anniversary uh, of the creation of the State of Israel. We have three categories, SAGEP, undergraduate, and graduate student. There's a cash prize in each category, and the winners will be announced and honored at our international conference that we are going to be having here at Concordia to commemorate and study uh, the 70 years of Israeli statehood in July 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rabbi's company and stay warm. <laughs>